accepted millions of dollars in foundation donations from countries where being gay is an offense punishable by prison or death, my administration will speak out against the oppression of women, gays, and people of different beliefs. To defeat Islamic terrorism, we must also speak out forcefully against a hateful ideology that provides the breeding ground for violence and terrorism to grow. Common thread linking the major Islamic terrorist attacks that have recently occurred on our soil, 9-11, the Fort Hood shooting. The Boston bombing. The San Bernardino attack. Orlando attack. His name is listed on the .com website in the cast section for this video, listed as a club patron. Here's the link. Amazing. There's the IMDB listing. There's him. Spirit of Orlando. He's a star in Spirit of Orlando shooting. Did you see Lou Burbano? One of his videos was Spirit of Orlando shooting up 2015. That's pretty weird. It's a music video. It's pretty lame, but the title is strange because of this shooting happened. I agree more. Let's go see. Spirit of Orlando, shooting up 2015. Swing the pendulum to absolute liberalism in every sphere, and then you let it go and let it swing to the other side so that you can get exactly what you want. Obama is the one who said the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. Now, if you look at the web pages, there's so much conjecture as to the, whether the man was perhaps a clandestine Muslim. And there are pictures of his ring, which tends to be Islamic, and there are pictures of, of him in uh, Islamic dress, and many, many statements to this effect. And if you look at the administration, many high officials are of the Muslim faith. So it seems as if America was being taken away from its Christian roots and swung in another direction. But prophecy said that the second beast, the United States of America, would implement legislation that would further the first beast, which is Catholicism. And therefore it must be a Christian nation bringing about Christian legislation. And here you had Obama taking the mindset in a totally opposite direction. This is a brilliant Hegelian dialectic. Whether he was, uh, whether he knew about what he was doing, whether he did it consciously, or whether he did it subconsciously is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is, this is what has happened. I believe, of course, that the insider elite is pretty clued up as to what the agenda is, but nevertheless, one can leave open the option that they might have done it unknowingly. But this was the legacy. And now, with the Trump administration, we are going to probably see 
the pendulum swing. Catholic Herald, Obama calls for world leaders to heed Pope Francis' message. The President of the United States said he wants fellow world leaders to reflect on Pope Francis' encyclical talking about the environment. So you have this, you have this dichotomy of thought. On the one hand, you have this movement towards a totally different religious system, and on the other hand, you have this underpinning of the papal system. And under his leadership, you had the visit of Pope Francis, where he went through the entire procedure, almost like a president of the world being inaugurated, speaking from the balcony, which is a step higher than any of the presidents have done. So you have this dichotomy of thought. You have, on the one hand, the appearance that it's moving in this direction, and on the other hand, the realities of the laws that it's moving in another direction. And then you had the two opponents. You had the one standing for the principles of the right, the other one standing for the principles on the left, and it was a vicious campaign. Now, is this a dialectic, a Hegelian dialectic? Is this a game of good cop, bad cop, or two ideologies which are to undergo pendulum swing? Well, let's have a look at some of the facts without judging any of the individuals and see whether we can come up with some form of conclusion. Here we have the famous supper, the so-called charity supper that takes place just before uh, the election, where you have the Archbishop of New York, who always is the head of the Knights of Malta in America, where he has this meal with uh, the candidates that are to be elected for president. And you can see the jovial nature. This is church and state at its best. And the two of them smiling next to Cardinal Dolan. Now it's interesting when you look at the, the actions of these individuals, you also get this idea of this dialectic. I mean, if you take the Cardinal for example, the papacy will make one statement, a very conservative statement, let's say with regard to uh, whatever, lifestyle choices or contraception. The papacy will make one, one statement and the people who are supposed to live it out will do exactly the opposite. So you're confused. You're thinking, why are the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta doing the exact opposite of what the papacy has just proclaimed? Why do you have this dichotomy of thought? Well, you see, in this thinking, there's this yin-yang aspect. The white aspect and the black aspect, well, they augment each other. The one cannot exist without the other, so they say, in this yin-yang philosophy. So even within the ranks of the church, you have this dichotomy of thought. Now, the two candidates, as we will see, fit the bill in every single aspect. If you go to the web pages and you look at the bloodlines of the American presidents, then it is a known fact that all the presidents that have, well, reigned in the United States have all been related. So let's have a look at what the media has to say. If all presidents are related, which of the 2017 candidates will be the next president? As it turns out, both Trump and Hillary Clinton are related to John of Gaunt, the 14th century royal. Gaunt was the first Duke of Lancaster, who was the son of King Edward III, according to my heritage. Trump is related through his mother, Mary Ann McLeod, back to his 17th grandfather, John Beaufort, while Clinton is related through her father and the Rodham family, back to the 17th great-grandmother, John Beaufort. The two candidates are 19th cousins, and so they both have the right bloodlines to continue this lineage. Now, that's another story as to why they should all be related. And it's fascinating that the Bible doesn't speak about the presidents of the world. It speaks about the kings of the world. And uh, it really, over the course of history, hasn't mattered which of the candidates has won because the candidates have always both been in the same bloodlines. Uh, here are the American... Uh, presidential bloodlines. Here's another page that explains this. Did you know 
All 44 US presidents have carried European royal bloodlines into office. 34 have been genetic descendants of just one person, Charlemagne, the brutal 8th century king of the Franks. Now, that's a fascinating story, because Charlemagne is, of course, the one who was crowned emperor of the Roman Empire, the new Roman Empire, and the Pope was crowning him whilst his kingdom was falling apart. So he's a symbol of this unity of the world under one leadership, the papacy. And then if we go to Edward III of England, in fact, the presidential candidates with the most royal genes has won every single American election. Now, it seems as if Trump and Hillary had exactly the same uh, lineage, so it didn't really matter which one of the two won. This information comes from Burke's Peerage, which is the Bible of aristocratic genealogy based in London. Every presidential election in America since and including George Washington in 1789 to Bill Clinton has been won by the candidate with the most British and French royal genes. Of the 42 presidents to Clinton, 33 have been related to two people, Alfred the Great, King of England, and Charlemagne, the most famous monarch of France. So it goes on. 19 of them are related to England's Edward III and has 2,000 blood connections to Prince Charles. The same goes with the banking families in America. George Bush and Barbara Bush are from the same bloodline, the Pierce bloodline, which changed its name from Percy when it crossed the Atlantic. Percy is one of the aristocratic families of Britain to this day. They were involved in the gunpowder plot to blow up Parliament at the time of Guy Fawkes. Now that's even more fascinating, because that was a Jesuit plot to overthrow the Protestant government in the United States. So if all these bloodlines belong to these individuals that uh, overthrew Protestantism, well, that would be an interesting plot for the puppet masters to work on behind the scenes. But we're just looking at the facts, so let's continue. The Mail Online predicted or showed that the Simpsons predicted the Donald Trump presidency and it didn't end well. Time travel episode from 2000 featured broke nation relied on aid from China. Now, as we have seen in some of the previous series that we have made, the Simpsons consists, well, the writers of The Simpsons are all probably insider individuals with uh, more knowledge about what is going to happen in the world than most would uh, deem possible. And uh, as some candidates have said in the past, if uh, something works out the way that it has worked out, it works out that way because it was planned that way. So there is that element, but there is also, of course, an element of, of luck maybe involved as well. Now, the Simpsons generally use many, many uh, esoteric symbols in their productions. And uh, they have been extremely accurate on a number of issues and have predicted many, many things that seemed unlikely or impossible years in advance. 9-11 being a case in point, the destructive events in the United States. And in their particular little uh, issues, 16 years before this presidential election, they showed their character in the same dress as Hillary Clinton would be wearing, including the necklace, including the earrings, and that's rather fascinating. It's interesting that uh, she actually wins the next election, but according to their scenario, Donald Trump would win the current election. So that's rather fascinating, and some of the statements and the ideologies that were contrasted there are, well, very strange to say the least. Uh, this comes from the year 2000, and they show Trump in his red tie and his jacket between the flags, and this happened in reality. So they're, they're pretty accurate, but it gets even more bizarre because they show that Trump, that's in 2000, greeting the people in Trump Towers, going down the escalator, raising his hand, and again he has the red tie and the suit on, and reality, 2015, Trump greeting the crowds, going down the escalator of Trump Towers, I mean, it's pretty accurate, 
It's pretty sharp. Now, whether this is pure coincidence or whether it is not is actually irrelevant. Some of the more bizarre ones, rather interesting, are the maps that we will see in a moment. And you can see their character here saying, oh no, it's actually come true. And this is the map that has been going around where they show what the, you know, the distribution of the votes would be, but this is actually not quite accurate because this one was actually one that they used in the Romney campaign, so it doesn't apply to that previous one. But nevertheless, it's interesting that they show these uh, red demographics, and of course this picture has changed in the present one, so you can not really use this one. Now let's have a look at some other facts, because what we are interested in is prophecy, and not the games and the dialectics that are being played in this world. The National Catholic Reporter tells us that Mike Pence, who is going to be the Vice President of the United States, which is a very, very powerful figure, is a born, again, evangelical Catholic. And uh, the web pages in the world tell us this very thing. Now, that's a somewhat of a misnomer, and a few years ago, that would not have been a possibility. To be a born-again evangelical Catholic would be considered an oxymoron. It would be impossible. In my youth, that would have been impossible. But the religious landscape has changed, and there's been such a merging of Catholicism and Protestantism that uh, this contradiction in terms is today a common reality. So, a born-again evangelical Catholic. They say, that he was a rather dedicated Catholic, Mike Pence. He, went, he was an altar boy and uh, very dedicated. And what about uh, Donald Trump? Well, Donald Trump is an, attended an Ivy League school, so let's ask the Washington Post something about his background. When he was young, he went to the private Kew Forest School in Forest Hills, Queens, where his father, Frederick, a very wealthy real estate developer, was on the governing board. Behavior problems led Donald's exit from the school, at which point he was sent to New York Military Academy at the age of 13 by his parents, and who hoped the discipline of the school would channel his energy in a positive manner. He did well there and went to Fordham University, a Jesuit school in the Bronx. So Donald Trump tries to downplay his Fordham experience and rather to upplay his later experiences. And uh, then he went to the University of Pennsylvania and studied economics for two years. So he did attend a Jesuit school, which is interesting and just one of the facts. Now let's go back to Mike Pence again, postmodern evangelical Catholic conservative. But Pence is also very much a creation of the ha last half century of America. American political religious life. Born and raised Catholic, he became a Catholic youth minister and reportedly wanted to be a priest. But according to interviews, Pence has given over the years, interestingly, he has more recently declined to talk specifically about his spiritual evolution. While in college from seven, 1978 to 81, he began blending his Catholicism with evangelical Protestantism. I made a commitment to Christ, Pence said. I'm a born-again evangelical Catholic. So here we have a Catholic vice president who is in a position to reach out to evangelicals. Now it's fascinating that the other side, of course, had chosen Tim Kaine as their uh, vice president. And the two met in debate, and apparently Mike Pence was the stronger candidate in that debate, or so they say, but nevertheless would have made any difference because both of these are Catholic gentlemen. And let's have a look what the Harvard Divinity School tells us about Tim Kaine and Mike Pence and faith. It says that Kaine was educated at a Jesuit high school and has been influenced throughout his life by Jesuits. Often seen as progressive and open-minded in the U.S., he's also been called a Pope Francis Catholic. What does it mean to be a liberal Catholic 
reformer. Now, this is rather fascinating. So you have these high-profile Catholics as vice presidents, uh, the one wanting to be a priest and was an altar boy, and the other one, all his training in Jesuit environments. Now, it's interesting that uh, the Jesuits themselves say, or Ignatius Loyola said, that if uh, you have to choose sides, then a Jesuit can choose one side and represent it to the point of death, while a fellow Jesuit may choose the opposite side and uh, defend that to the point of death. That is the Hegelian dialectic, and it's fascinating how it works. So it really wouldn't have mattered which one of these two would have become the vice president, and it really wouldn't have mattered which one of these two would have become president. Now, before I even talked about this, I I thought that Hillary Clinton would probably fit the modern profile somewhat better, but I also said it doesn't matter which one of them wins. But now on reflection, it becomes rather interesting that it went the way it went. Now, in the discussion here with these people from Harvard, uh, Donald Trump's running mate, Governor Mike Pence, described himself as a born-again evangelical Catholic. Is this an unusual faith mix? And what does this combination say about his public service? And the answer? I'm not quite sure what Governor Pence intends to affirm by a born-again evangelical Catholic. He comes from an Irish Catholic background, was raised as such during college, Indiana and Nova College. He had an evangelical religious experience under the influence of a non-denominational group. However, in the following years, he still considered himself a Catholic, went to Mass, worked as a youth minister at a Catholic church, and even thought of becoming a priest. However, in the mid-1990s, he joined the Grace Evangelical Church, which is affiliated with the Evangelical Free Church in America. One could describe it as a Baptist denomination. It was, however, the church to which he started to take his family in Indianapolis. At that time, he described himself as a Christian, conservative, Republican, in that order. In this description, the word Catholic was not present. So, when we look at these two, they are both capable of fulfilling the prophetic agenda. Pope Francis calls for unity between evangelicals, Catholics, and he said that division is the work of the devil. So they had to be brought together. So Pence is actually the perfect one, because he is both Catholic and evangelical and can bring them together. Pope Francis has called for unity amongst evangelicals, Catholics, and Christians from other denominations, emphasizing that we are one in Christ and warning that division between the groups is the work of the devil. It is the division is the work of the father of lies, the father of discord, who does everything possible to keep us divided, Francis said in a video message to a gathering sponsored by the John 17 movement. Now, the John 17 movement was a movement to gather all the evangelicals under one umbrella under the papacy or together with the papacy. Charisma News gives a very interesting insight. It tells us that Kenneth Copeland laid hands on Donald Trump and prayed over him. This is fascinating. Well, Charisma News is a very prominent journal. Earlier this month, we reported how Paula White set up an invitation-only meeting between the Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump and evangelical pastors. That meeting happened this week, and plenty of Pentecostals were there to lay hands on the billionaire, make declarations of his life and pray. Beyond Paula White, also present were Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, and then another whole host of very prominent evangelical leaders. Where is this heading towards? Are we heading towards a union of church and state? Now, what is Donald Trump? Well, let's have a look. Religious News Services says, is Donald Trump now a born-again Christian? And when I, when I read uh, what the journal Christianity Today had to say about Donald Trump, about his remarks and his anti woman statements and his, his wild statements, then they were, well, less than pleased, it seems. And now, afterwards, they're all scattering and trying to come together on these issues. Donald Trump has described himself as a Presbyterian 
and Protestant. A Sunday church person, which is very fascinating, and a collector of Bibles. Now, the presumptive Republican presidential nominee reportedly can add born-again Christian to that list too, according to one of the members of Trump's new evangelical advisory board. So here you have a Sunday keeping Protestant. Now, if you're going to reach out to the religious community and bring them together, wouldn't it be interesting if the Protestant reaches out to the Catholics and the Catholics reaches out to the Protestants? Then you would have a perfect mix. But uh, I found this rather interesting and an interesting mix because by some of his statements, it is uh, hard to imagine that all of this is, you know, perfect truth. Now, this was the statement that Donald Trump made to the Catholic world. Catholics are an important part of the American story. America has been strengthened by hardworking Catholics. From New York to California, the Catholic story is truly unique, and it's a great story. From marching for civil rights to educating millions of children, serving the poor, and helping to find the pro-life movement, Clergy and lay Catholics across the country have made countless contributions to the American success and the American success story. Washington politicians have been hostile to the church. They have been hostile to Catholics. They have been hostile to the members of Catholicism. My administration will stand side by side with the American Catholics to promote the values we all share as Christians and Americans. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. We will make America great again. So there you have Donald Trump reaching out to the Catholic community. A Protestant, born again Protestant. And on the other hand, you have Mike Pence, who said, I'm a Christian, conservative, and Republican in that order, and left out the little fact that he was thoroughly Catholic. Let's listen to what he had to say. Greetings, I'm Governor Mike Pence. You know, it's my honor this year to serve as the Republican nominee for Vice President of the United States with my running mate, Donald Trump. I'm grateful to be able to join you, if only by videotape, but I'm not sure how they introduce me. The introduction I prefer is pretty short. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. And really, it's as a fellow believer uh, that I'm particularly honored to be able to address you today. I know every one of us has our own story about how we came to faith. For me, I was raised in a family where faith was important church on Sunday, grace before dinner. But my faith became my own when I made a personal decision to trust Jesus Christ during the spring of my freshman year in college. That night, my heart was literally broken wide with gratitude and with joy when I came to realize that what happened on the cross in some small measure actually happened for me. And I know all of you in the room share that same passion and that same sense of gratitude for what was done on our behalf. Years later, my faith has been tested, relied on more times than I could possibly count. All I know for sure today is I need him more than ever. And he's really the center of my life and the center of my family's life. You know, God's love really eclipses our failings. And as always, he's been a source of renewal and strengthening for this nation and for people of faith throughout our history. In these troubled times, I believe we stand at a turning point. When those who cherish faith, those who cherish freedom, those who cherish the sanctity of life and all the liberties enshrined in our Constitution should step forward and heed the call to action. I joined Donald Trump on the Republican ticket because I believe he has the right leadership and the right vision to make America great again. President Donald Trump will appoint justices to the Supreme Court who will uphold our Constitution and the rights of the unborn. Donald Trump will also sign into law legislation that will free up the voices of faith all across this country by repealing what's come to be known as the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment's literally been on the books since the 1950s, and it essentially threatens tax-exempt organizations and churches with losing their tax status if they speak out on important issues facing the nation from the pulpit. Donald Trump and I are both committed to work with re renewed Republican majorities in the House and the Senate to repeal the Johnson Amendment once and for all. You know, the truth is that a, a careful study of American history has shown that the strength of our nation has come from our communities of faith. Throughout our history, it's been the voices of faith that more often than not have driven our nation to a more perfect union. It was the pulpits uh, around the American founding that thundered against the tyranny of King George. 
it was the pulpits around America that spoke of the evils of slavery and brought an end to the scourge of slavery in America, even through a great civil conflict. And it was voices of faith and communities of faith that transformed our nation through the civil rights movement uh, in our own lifetime, and we're a better nation for it. The choice today for all of us, though, could not be more clear. I've never seen a more dramatic choice in a national election in my lifetime. I truly do believe we're, we're come to a time for choosing. And I think it's a time in the life of our nation when people who cherish life, when people who cherish our liberties, when she, people who cherish the great traditions that are enshrined in our Constitution should come together and support Donald Trump and our agenda to make America great again. In these troubled times at home and abroad, challenging times for American families, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to do one more thing, and that is to bow the head and bend the knee in the days that remain in this election. Pray for our country. But as you do so, please pray as, as Lincoln said was his prayer, not so much that, that God would be on our side, but that we would be, in his words, on God's side. Because I truly do believe in my heart of hearts that what's been true for millennia is still true today, that if his people, who are called by his name, will humble themselves and pray, he'll again do as he's always done throughout the storied history of this nation. He'll hear from heaven, and he'll heal our land. This one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today. May God bless you, your families, this community of faith, your church, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. So just to briefly read.